Right, Vic, well, thank you very, very much indeed for that. That is by quite a long chalk the most convincing exposition of how nucleons are bound that I have ever heard. And I've sat through a few models of how nucleons are formed as well, including a couple that you mentioned, the liquid drop model and the icing model. But um, for me, you take the biscuit there. That's the best I've seen. Thank you very much for that very clear and very exciting exposition. Well, anyway, thank you. I'd like to uh, throw the um, floor open for any questions from anyone. Yeah, I have one to start. First of all, um, so you are beautifully showing how the strong nuclear force is really electromagnetism. Correct? Yes. Yes. So um, the question that I have is you mentioned that the nucleon bonding between each other in the same layer is stronger than the magnetic binding between the layers. And yes. my question um, it's my understanding that the magnetic force is about two orders of magnitude stronger than the electric force. So is that true on the, that the bonding in the nucleon layers is stronger because it involves both? It's the charge overlap reinforced by the magnetic fields with opposite spin? Yes. Yes. Let, let, me, let me answer that one too. The, the the spin coupling you're seeing is a dipole coupling. You're not seeing that you're not seeing the magnetic field in its full force. That's already been dealt with in terms of things that are already wrapped up inside the mechanism which binds the elementary particles themselves. Because when, when Viv's talking about um, is Viv talking about this uh, division by zero binding is 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 the same sort of thing when I'm talking about field cancellation, you're talking about a, a primitive force here where, 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 where because you have an overlap, you have a sharing, and you have sharing between magnetic layers, they're roughly, the fact that you have roughly a, femto, fem, a femtometer between things within a layer and between layers means the actual strength there is similar. It's, it's weaker between the two things, but it's not, it's not orders of magnitude apart. One's the dipole one, and that is in principle inverse Q, so it gets weaker very rapidly as you move them further apart. <clears throat> the other one's monopole, which is inverse square, uh, at least at large distances. And these are not large distances when you've got nuclear binding. At that stage, you're in almost a balanced situation between the two. But it's not the same thing, magnetic monopole um, binding to a magnetic dipole binding. You're down, a, you're, down a whole, you're down a whole order here. You've got a couple of those things coming in. Okay. But, sorry, Viv, I was... Uh, I was, I was I think that's quite all right. You've got to bear in mind that much of the magnetic uh, force is... Uh, At large... They, uh, they, they, yeah, they... Uh, they is, is, much of it is contained within the layers as each nucleon tries to get... As, and this idea that the strong force is something that's really, really strong and very difficult to break, as John has said, it's... Um, it's not all that strong. As soon as you start adding a little bit of, oh, I'll show you later on the next talk, you add a, a neutron or two that pulls the, uh, can pull the protons a little bit away from that structure and the nucleus disintegrates. So while it is a strong force, it's not by fun. It, it, if, if you didn't have that additional magnetic binding and much of magnetic energy taken up in that binding between layers, then the nuclei wouldn't hold together so that the what is left between the layers is not all that strong. And rapidly falling off, as is observed, of course, that's what you need. Yes. But in, 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 um, in model too, which is anyway, a different thing. I'll certainly leave it up to other mathematicians to try and calculate the exact values. Any more questions? Oh, direct, uh, oh. Directly. Oh, was it that good? <laughs> well, <I can't>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Um, one thing that's um, one thing that's missing here is the is is is, is the is the, the element which makes the photons rotate in the first place. The thing that's keeping the photon rotating. Um, but of course, that doesn't need to be missing because um, what we're talking about here is 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 the same kind of force is also present in nucleons that's present in the elementary particles themselves. But once again, that force is subsumed in making sure that the proton and the neutron in Viv's model have the kind of structure that they have, the kind of planar structure that they have. That planar structure, once you start putting it into, into nucleons, these particles are not really distinct particles anymore. 
Because if you look at something, especially the alpha particle, the kind of binding energy that's getting in there per nucleon is a significant fraction of the mass of the nucleons. You're talking about something which is now a composite thing, which has flows of elementary stuff, flows of elementary photons between the layers in those things. Now, I notice there are some discrepancies between your magnetic moments calculated uh, by doing a simple sum, by a simple model, just adding them up. And the actual ones observed tend to be smaller than that. Now, that kind of process is going to reduce those magnetic moments. It's going to symmetrize the system. Yes. But once we get to that next level of complexity, that sort of thing will start coming out of the model quite nicely as well. But I think they're spectacularly close. Uh, really, I, I mean, the, the fact that it's not exactly one or two percent within what I would just not worry about that at all and I noticed we're not really worried about it already but no. I'm surprised it's that close just by adding, adding stuff up actually, frankly. The, the object of this presentation is just to provide the background as I said in my very first talk each of these topics really needs a lecture series in their own right um, but I'm just giving enough so that people can understand it uh, the next lecture, of course, we may go through and discuss how that's a, applied to well, everything from, uh, I've already done, <clears throat> uh, deuterium, but all the way through to uranium-235 and 238. Uh, not, not every nucleon, not every nucleus, of course, but quite a few of them. Uh, and this is just the introduction to that. Uh, <laughs> going, going through all of them, man. But yeah, you're right. To, exp to properly explain this requires several more lectures, but uh, either people can get a, you can either appreciate the principles and if you're interested, continue them yourself, or uh, and say when it comes to the uh, structure of all of the nuclei, and there's over 2,800 of them that they've uh, so far managed to uh, add. Uh, in, in total, uh, you just can't do that. But I can, at least I can lay down the principles, and you'll find that the same principles that I well, similar principles apply for all of the nuclei. And it just makes, in my opinion, it makes nuclear physics a much easier topic to follow. Hi, Vivian. I, I, I should say I would applaud you for your ambitious project. In fact, it is something uh, pretty. I spent about uh, more than 20 years in the nuclear physics. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, a very, very, very new perspective that you, the way you are providing. And then, if you look at what the strong force was really trying to do, is basically what you are putting in in a more, uh, I would say, uh, unclear way, if you want to call that. Way, but basically, saying that I got a power potential and I got a cutoff point, where it's going to drop off exponentially. But inside is what I'm going to have is a one over R dependent, which is the same as electromagnetic force, for example, right? So that's what exactly it is trying to do. So, but I think you've got a very ambitious project. I really applaud you on that. And I was also looking at, uh, well, if you, if generally, I would divide the nuclear physics guys into two groups. Uh, one is what you call a collective group, collective model group. For them, the nucleus is a blob. I used to call this one nucleus is nothing but a charge blob. And it's a bit of which has got certain mass. And like they try to phenomenologically describe putting in the electromagnetic force, of course, that's what they're doing all the time. And then bring all the electromagnetic properties uh, about what the quadrupole moment is like, what the monopole magnetic dipole transitions are like, what the electromagnetic transitions are like, and what the different moments are like. And where they get stuck is the following you take any nucleus, there is not no nucleus is completely discovered by any model, in fact. Nothing. Not, no, no single model. You can give any model, in fact. But no single nucleus of all the 2,800 or whatever you have got there. Nothing is described. In the same way, you take any single, single nuclear property, such as what is the distribution of the electro quadrupole transitions? What is the distribution of the electromagnetic moments, for example? There is no single model. In fact, no model, in fact, can describe those things. So my question to you is the following. How ambitious are you to go up into describe the excitation properties of a nuclear or things like that? Yeah, that's where we have spent a lot of energies. The nuclear physics people have not really spent so much of time in understanding the binding energies of the nuclei anymore. This is kind of a phenomenologically god. We know how it works. For example, I can tell you how much of energy is released if the uranium-238 fissions, for example. 
I can do the same thing with 235. I can also tell you how much of fusion energy will be coming out. And I can also tell you how much of energy I can put into a system to make some reaction happen. But I cannot describe anything beyond that. So my question is, uh, what is your ambition? How, are, how far do you want to take this? That's what I'm asking, basically. <sighs> well, um, like I said uh, a couple of minutes ago, the whole idea of this is to <clears throat> present just the foundations. Uh, <clears throat> I can, of course, uh, well, yes, I, I know other theories are out there. A lot of them have some explanation. A lot of models have some explanations for some of the properties and some of the structures. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be covering <clears throat> I'll be covering a, a, a lot more of those in in the next lecture. Uh, I um, but the object of my presentation in, in, in all of these series is just to lay the foundations. Of course, I can take uh, all of these calculations somewhat further than I can, um, <clears throat> but that would require a lot more time. I think people like yourselves, I and mean, you've had a lot more experience at this than I have. You're very well aware of the, uh, a lot more aware of the structure of pro uh, properties of nuclei. Uh, it's probably best that the, that question could be answered when uh, when you've seen the uh, the presentation of how it matches all other nuclei. Mm -hmm. uh, I do uh, I probably do about <clears throat> two two and a half percent of the two thousand eight hundred that are there. It's still an enormous long way to go, uh, and I think that the question would be, the questions that you put. You know, how far do I want to take it? How far can it go? would be best answered uh, after the next talk, because this one only does what I do, uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and carbon. Uh, there are um, <clears throat> an awful lot more nuclei that are covered. Uh, they need a few couple more rules, but there are an awful lot more that uh, will be covered, and the question probably be best uh, asked at the end when you see just how it fits in with the rest of them. That's very good, very good. I mean, I really enjoyed your talk a lot. As I mentioned, this is just, it kind of brought my memories back because, like I said, I spent about uh, more than 20 years of my life uh, in the nuclear structure, nuclear reactions, nuclear decays. That's where I was all the time. And then uh, then you talk about the alpha, the deuteron being like a lithium being an alpha and deuteron put together kind of a thing. There were these models, in fact, alpha clustering, de deuteron clustering, alpha hel helium-3 triton as a structure of lithium-6. They were all done uh, in, in many different ways. But but the point is, that none of them, of course, were able to completely describe, not even a single property of a nucleus, of course. That's, that's a weakness of the parameters which you are doing. But uh, the way you are going around it, I think, yeah, this is this is fascinating, in fact. I, I really like, I like, like the way you have done that. And I look forward to hearing your next lectures, too, in fact. Indeed. Can I, say something, can I, may I say something about this? Yeah. This is a huge new paradigm yes, that is. involved in here because it goes right the way down from Viv's right into the nature of the electron and the proton uh, the electron itself. This is utterly enormous in terms of its potential, but look at how easily calculable these things are with a little bit of modeling, with moving those things around, with properly doing the field cancellation intervals. They're not very hard. Mm -hmm. Look at it. 3D cancellation there. Um, it, it's not for me or for, well, I've done this sort of thing in the past as well. I've done field modeling calculations in the past. I'm not going to because I think we have bigger fish to fry. I think that what Viv's doing in terms of introducing the beginnings of this is the work of a hundred folk for a hundred years to sort this stuff out. But look at- No wonder I got so many great hairs. <laughs> look at how beautiful it is on the surface so quickly, but then compare it. Look, look, look realize what's just happened. The strong interaction in terms of quarks and gluons isn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll I'll come to that when I'm giving my own talk about it. But, that, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I really applaud the view for this uh, very interesting approach. I should say that that was really good. I really enjoyed listening to you all the time. Indeed, this, this is fascinating.
and the, the way you got the numbers in front that's that was very interesting i know there are some things which you have to worry about how this point one e working point one that, that those are the details of course which way which way i can quibble with that but the fact that you can get i was looking at the, the your magnetic dipole moments of the helium three and the triton which you presented the numbers there and then they're so close in fact you don't have to apologize when it's one to two percent deviation from what the measured values measured numbers themselves have got one to two percent deviations okay so so don't even bother to apologize <laughs> be a, don't be no. for those Terry, it's great to hear your reaction to that and i think we just heard a talk which is going to win vivian the Nobel noble prize if he lives long you know yeah so, so do your best <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you john but uh, not enough uh, what it requires john is that i mentioned in my first talk that uh, you had all of the answers for the um <clears throat> uh why Proton, uh, why protons would rotate in this double loop structure. Uh, and it's going to be like the uh, Zweig and Gilman presentation of quarks in the first place. I think it was, was Zweig came up with the, uh, the physical description, but nobody paid any attention to him until uh, Gilman came up with the mathematical description. I don't know whether that was the right way around or not, but uh, yes, I mean, this is, uh, I think this is a real game changer for nuclear physics and that people should now, um, the nuclear physicists are still there scratching their head, uh, it doesn't seem to make sense and they can't get it. I think this is something, particularly after you see the next lecture, uh, this is something that people will find um, will make nuclear physics very, very simple. Yes, well, I, I, completely, I completely agree with that. And, uh, and uh, it, the whole process right from the beginning, and you're not going to stop here either. We're not going to stop here. We're going to be no, no. right from the beginning to the end. So, um, yeah. so what a lovely, smooth, continuous, unbroken beginning to end that's going to be. Well, but bearing in mind, you must also bear in mind that at this stage, at each of those structures comes its uh, own self-generated de Boyle wavelength, plus also the special relativity corrections with motion. That's right. So it's not like you have to throw them in on top of that to match experiment. They come equipped with it. That's what I like about this model. The thing is, this makes immediate sense. Now, I've sat through a lot of talks mm -hmm. on nuclear physics, and as I say, and some of them I struggle to understand, I see models and so forth at one time or another, beautiful though they are, and, and marvelous though they have, uh, elements though they have, but this is one that just makes sense right the way through. And that for me, in nuclear physics, I mean, I've heard parts of it before, so I'm at a slight advantage to some of you here, but it was always the case. It was the first, first moment I saw this stuff. I thought, wow, that really is something. I've been looking forward to this talk very much. Oh, you're going to the next one, John. <laughs> I know. I'll even put a tie on to, <laughs> to show that this is good. <laughs> Bib, 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 uh, it's when you start wearing a hat that I'm going to worry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, that's fantastic. Any, 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 any more, any more things people would like to jump in? And, uh, yeah, I have a, I have a question, a conceptual one. Uh, when, when you deal with these flat rotations, uh, it, it, it can all make sense on a mathematical basis. But I'm just wondering to what extent uh, are we supposed to visualize this in our normal three dimensional, um, specifically, for example, the stacking. Does that mean that the nucleus should actually have a cylindrical shape as it goes up in, uh, you know, to to uh, heavier and heavier uh, nuclei, or or is there some? I'm just wondering, is there any sense in attempting to visualize all this stuff in a three-dimensional world, or are we just past that? Uh, no, I think you should see the uh, the next lecture that answers a lot of that. There are some rules for binding, and uh, <clears throat> the rules I'll give include that they will try to they will tr nucleons will try to form something close to spherical or um, football uh, rugby ball shape, cylindrical. Not what do you call a rugby ball shape? Uh, elliptical. 
circular or elliptical, they'll try to form circular or elliptical shapes. They obviously won't because as individual particles, you'll get uh, bumps where some nucleons will stick out and uh, dimples where some will stick in. <clears throat> and to the best of my knowledge, that, that's also been observed. Uh, but I think that question would be better answered again at the end of the next uh, talk. And I do believe that, yes, you, you should be able to visualize them uh, in layers and layers stacked upon each other. I mean, it would make a, a wonderful software program for somebody to work out <clears throat> the structures and uh, properties of all of the nuclei. <clears throat> so I think it can be visualized. I think it can be visualized. Uh, Wolf, uh, I've looked at a couple of these things. If you try and envisage something like a starship made of Lego, a three-dimensional, you know, these sort of battle star things that, that look, they look a bit like that. But yeah, they are three-dimensional. No. Um, I, I, I really like, the, John, when you said earlier about I like the concept of combining the way you describe things and the way Viv describes things and seeing two aspects of the same thing. When Viv is talking about field overlaps and you talking about cancellations or become things becoming one flow, I think it's really useful to think about that. It's really interesting to think about that, where we can you can break them down into units and figure out how the thing stacks. But once it locks in, it's one con it's one continuous flow of resonant energy, which I think is a beautiful way of thinking of it. There's going to be a later talk, which I'm, which I'm sort of holding in reserve for when we don't have a Sunday, which <laughs> somebody wanting to talk on a Sunday, um, which is going to talk about, um, which is going to talk about forces, which is going to talk about the fact there is only one force, and that all the forces, the strong, the weak, the electromagnetic gravitation as well, are all derivative of the same thing. Now, Viv's stolen my thunder a little bit here on this by coming along and saying, look, wait a minute, the strong force electromagnetic. As it is, and uh, and uh, and, but it's a different kind of electromagnetic. It's, that, it's this electromagnetic that has an overlap, where things are being shared, and that sharing is a cancellation. And once you start getting a cancellation, you're talking about nuclear binding energies, not electromagnetic interaction over some sort of one atom to distance. You're talking about huge. It's inverse square. Look, everybody knows there's an infinity on the electron as you go down to as you go down to as you go down to overlap. This division by zero force is in quantum electrodynamics precisely infinite. Now that's quite a big force. That's not strong. Forget about strong. Strong isn't in there. This is this is not even super strong. It's not even hyper strong. It's kind of it. It's it, it's the ultimate immovable object. Forget about all this hierarchy of forces. It's just lack of imagination. So uh, uh, different forces, I mean, that is this, this characterization, strong, weak, electromagnetic, gravitational, maybe something else, somewhere else. No, 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 no this is all too complicated. Nature's not going to be that complicated. Oh, yeah, I think no, I need no. to report it. No way. Forget about it. It's got to be simpler than that, and it is simpler than that. And I'll try and show that later. So it's a, it's a way of showing on a force sense what we show with the electromagnetic spectrum, that radio waves and microwaves and gamma rays are all the same thing. They're just different parts of the same spectrum, which is the same yeah. thing here, essentially what you're well, saying. They need, they need unifying. So, um, so, uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that talk as well. But that's after all of this. So, uh, so uh, uh, ma making it 2 a.m. my time, which is your Sunday <laughs> time start, yeah. I'm afraid it's just, just <laughs> out for me. <laughs> Sorry. If you can make it 4 a.m., I don't mind, but 2 a.m., no, just... Sorry about that. <laughs> it's easy. So, We've just got to make sure we don't live on a non-spherical planet, Viv. That's the only possibility. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a planet where you, we're all on the same side of the disk. Got to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, just, hey, that's the way it is. It is, yeah. Anyway, that was uh, a completely brilliant talk. And, and anybody else... Uh, Ch Ch Chari, what, what did you reckon? I mean, you're in sort of high energy physics and nuclear physics area there. Uh, were, were you running a mile from that, or did you? Did, uh, you sounded pretty excited about that. Is that? Uh, uh, what, what do you think in terms of what I just said about strong, strong interactions? No, the, um, I, I go much deeper than that. In fact, so you may not really. The, the, I really think um, the way we have um, been writing down the dynamics of the any system basically there's a fundamental assumption that we can discern this into two components one we call the interaction the other is interactance 
that we can separate. However, when we do the experiments and we do the calculations, we cannot separate them, in fact. So my question goes back to that particular thing. Can we really discern the, the physical dynamics into two components, two constituents separately, and then tell us that there is a force, there is an interactant, or do they really mix with each other so that when we come to very, very ultimate details of that at very elementary level, we cannot discern them, we cannot separate them? That's, you that's right. You can't separate them. What, what we're talking about is not forces. We're talking about force-free motion. So we have to have an equation. We have to come, come to a dynamical equation which says that, that the total force is zero. Now, that, 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 exactly. So then you've got interactions. In, uh, the interactions, interactions and interactions and counteractions and coupling. So there exactly. are a couple of things. But, but, but eventually, not, it's not forces between things. It's everything moving in such a way that the total fluid flow, of whatever that fluid right. is, and oh, that, an electromagnetic fluid, but I would say no, it's an electromass magnetic fluid. And when he says electromagnetic, he doesn't, you know, the electron cannot be purely electromagnetic because purely electromagnetic isn't going to bind it. You also need the binding. Mm -hmm. In the theory, in the, in the dg equals zero equation, then you have that binding because you have the interaction between mass and field. Yeah. And, and that interaction between mass and field, if you take its derivative, if you take its four derivative, you get a set of generalized forces. And those generalized forces are of the nature of a force, but of the strength of infinity. Yeah. The, the, these are just happen forces. They're not. They're not. Oh, yeah. Maybe we'll deal with this force or not. These are forces that just happen. They are so strong that they are infinitely strong. A changing electric field gives rise to a changing magnetic field, and there is nothing that stops that. There is no force of nature that can stop a changing electric or changing magnetic. It's infinite. Yeah. It's infinitely strong. But that's not the whole of the dynamics. The dynamics also includes the mass part of the dynamics. The what I call the Quetschog and the pivot dynamics in, in my theory. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing, no, you can't separate it because it's all one flow. It's not one thing. Okay. You mustn't separate it. They all have to go into, eventually it all has to go into the same equation. And that equation must be total force equals zero. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's it. So all of the things that can possibly, now some of those forces are so strong that, you, that they don't even manifest, they just satisfy themselves. Okay. But others, and, and at the level that Viv's at, the forces that are interacting here are the dipole magnetic mm -hmm. and the monopole electric. And they're at the same sort of level here. So they're sort of going, Ooh, yeah, I think I'll come a little bit closer and we'll have a sort of 60 degree. I bet it's not 60, I bet it's 58 or something. Anyway, we'll have some diamond, which is not quite 60 degrees for the, uh, for the but, but pretty much he's got it precisely at the 60 degrees and at the, and at the diamond shape for the alpha particle because but the problem comes like this, right? That again, we come back to the ideas of observer dependent um, phenomena, which will also depend upon the frame. And what yeah. I call 60, 60 degrees is not the 60 degrees for somebody else. You're not uh, wrong. And, 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 <laughs> and these are relative, look at the energies involved. Things are moving around with, uh, what is, what's the what's funny energy? It's seven, it's, Seven percent for alpha particles, isn't it? Something like that. No, no, yeah, no, 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 I don't yeah, know. Fast, yeah. moving around fast. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head, but these are these are they're not very ultra relativistic, but they're in, but there's a relativistic correction there, which is not insignificant. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's that, that that's also worrisome indeed. And then, uh, yeah, no, there, there are a few things which I still have to digest, but basically, the I, like I said, this is a. The binding wise, what he's trying to do in a in a way, I see that, and that the numbers coming out so close is is one thing, of course, but then the the the, the concept is very different. That, that I like that very much. I like that very much. That's very interesting. And then the, the person was asking him, okay, what else he has got uh, on his uh, on his on his plate for him to carry on, because uh, the getting the, the these numbers have been um, okay when people have done. If you, if you think about the nuclear guys, uh, in the, from, from, from the beginning, in fact, they always took proton and neutron to be as like a basic entities. We don't question what those properties are. So we take it. Yeah, we take its mass, we take its uh, whatever we have, we have got there. And from there, we try to build what the binding energy differences are. We're always talking about the relative binding energies also. Also, we should remember that. It's never like an absolute number that we can get from these things. So when we try to make the models, uh, either you go to a collective model which have no predictive power that are simply basically giving you what we observe and or you go to the shell model which is the discrete models which you try to predict to some extent, 
on, very unsuccessful in that. Quite unsuccessful. You can keep yeah, on doing it. Keep on doing it. So, but mm -hmm. I think in, in that sense, if you look at it, this is like a very fresh uh, approach, which I, I think is very interesting, which is very interesting. And then uh, we, even if we can just get the binding energies of all these guys in a different description, that itself is a, a major achievement, major achievement. I would not worry anything beyond that. So <laughs> congratulations, in fact, in that sense. Yeah. No, good. I'm, I'm delighted at the reaction from you because uh, that's that's exactly how I felt pretty much when I first saw this stuff. Yes, just, 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 just tremendous. And, and, and but you know what's really what's really scary is how much trouble Viv's got had getting this stuff noticed. Yeah, no, I'm how not surprised. Is that? How ridiculous is that? What is going wrong? This yeah. needs fixing. Something else needs fixing. We we discussed that on Friday. I'll come out soon. Yeah. 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 When we talk about the. Photon, like I was mentioning in my mail to you guys about the other day, current photon understanding is not a photon, it's an electromagnetic quantum. <laughs> not totally, not really. So then I scratch my head and say, what's going on here? And then we think about the rotating photon. I say, well, what are the it's a dynamics, in fact? That's one of my concerns, basically. That's ma my major concern about the rotating photon model is, uh, if I think about it, if, if something which is rotating is subject to some kind of a force. That's yeah. my, my, yeah, my that's, class bringing. That's, that's where you've already gone wrong, Chari. Sorry. That's just my class that I'm bringing. That's what I'm saying. My yeah, class exactly. I'm bringing. Wrong, wrong. Listen, listen. Let, let, let me tell you in, in, in one line what, what, why that's wrong. Look, uh, Maxwell's equation is a df equals zero. Okay, it's a four derivative on a six field is equal to zero, right? Yeah. Now, now, uh, what, what are, now uh, okay. Now, if, if I look at... Um, the generalized Lorentz force, it's F times J. It's the uh, it's the field times the four current, F mm -hmm. times J. But Maxwell's equation is a DF equals J. Mm -hmm. So FJ is FDF. Oh, That's oh. a generalized force. Now FDF yeah. is a generalized force. Now I'm gonna generalize that to GDG. So instead of the six components of field, the 16 components of mass field, spin and, and current, so if I do GDG, that's also a generalized force. That's a generalized force. Mm -hmm. Now, my equation is DG equals zero, and the force equation would be GDG equals zero. Is now, DG equals zero, GDG equals zero, it's force-free motion. It's always mm -hmm. been force-free motion. Maxwell's equations are an abstraction of force-free motion for the electromagnetic <laughs> field. Now, Maxwell mm -hmm. found those by experiment and put them together with some pretty spectacular thinking. But it's just force free motion, and force free motion is the thing. So you're saying there's a force, but you can say there's a force if you try to split the things up into bits and you say there's this bit here and this bit there. But there isn't, it's a whole single thing. It's a whole single thing. And in a whole single thing, all of the bits of that thing have to be in balance. DG equals zero is saying that everything is in balance, things can change, or, 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 or Peter's um, Milpotent equation, the same thing. Same thing, you have some sort of differential yeah. time uh, with, with, with some sort of prefactor times some sort of exponential. And then you're <coughs> going to be exponentials. So it has to have all of the solutions we have of all of the linear theories we have are of that form, Maxwell's equations, the Dirac equation. Some of them are bastardized like the Schrodinger equation because you have d double differentials and single differentials. So that's because you've gone to the second order thing for the energy, which is mm -hmm. a bit double, never mind, but that's all you have. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you use the Dirac equation to do solid state physics because it's not quite right. There's a Dirac made a couple of little mistakes, which took me a long time to work out what they were, but then Peter too. But there's not many of us who've got yeah, it's pretty hard to understand. Dirac was very clever. It's pretty hard just to get what he was doing, let alone to see where he went wrong. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, look, Dirac equation is a linear equation. Linear equations have exponential solutions. They have solutions which we can look up in the big you know, we, we know what these solutions are. They're in grad state, they're in they're in Morse and Feshback. We know what the solutions are. Sure. But it's in a different paradigm. But the whole thing is a force-free equation. Okay. Back equations are a force-free equation, uh, are, are a, a part of a force-free equation, a little bit in the corner of a force-free equation. But we're generalizing this. This is new. This is huge. What we're doing here in Quisicle is immense. And and Viv's part of it there is completely original, absolutely spectacular. I mean, look mm -hmm. at that. Look at that. That is just magnificent. That, that's something that I would have just been so excited about if I'd seen it in any kind of physics lecture at any university I've ever been in. That That is magnificent work, really, isn't it? Look at it. 
No, absolutely. Like, like, I, like I mentioned, all, the, the, this, all these things which we get in bits and pieces here and there seems to fall into one, one particular grand scheme or a simple scheme, basically. Uh, that, that, that's very, very, very exciting indeed. So that's why I said, we've uh, all the best. That, that sounds pretty good. In fact, I'm pretty excited and looking forward to your next lecture indeed. This is only 20% of what he's going to tell you about. You were just oh, yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 80%. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> 80%. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. But you know, like I, I still have to come around with, uh, like I said, my own background <clears throat> is in the experimental side, which I have been spending a lot of time. But then, of course, I was heavily involved in the modeling and uh, calculating my experimental parameters and so on and so forth. But uh, I got, I went, I used to say, tell my colleagues, all I understand from my nuclear physics, which I was doing, was uh, if I work on the collective models, nucleus is a charge blob, a blob of charge sitting with a Z there and then some mass there and plug it in. Liquid then, drop model works as well. Exactly. Right? Precisely, precisely <laughs> nothing more than that. And then I can now go and make the measurements. I can get measure the B2 values. I can measure the excitation for the scissors more and so forth. I can say, yeah, I can get what those parameters are. And I have learned nothing new beyond to say what those parameters in my model are going to be like. And no predictive power for the next nucleus, for example. Unless I go to the shell model, which will tell me something. Oh, you can expect maxima here, minima here, and so on and so forth. Again, very qualitative way. Yeah, this is this is much more quantitative, as you'll see as well. I'll leave it to Viv to tell it next yeah. week. Yeah, I think so. I'd, I'd just like it, just to give you some indication. Uh, we were talking at the meeting yesterday about the uh, the problems with the system. I tried to talk to the uh, we got in Australia the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization, and I met the head of that and tried to talk to him and show him some of this work and some of the other people there. And all I got was from we won't consider anything unless it's published. And oh. then you try and get it published, and what do they say? This is not standard model, or a dozen other excuses. We're not publishing it. So what you, I've been working on this for a long time. It could have been out there a long time ago, but th this is the system that currently exists. Nobody will consider it unless it's published, and then they won't publish it because it's not a standard model. No wonder they're bogged down. They can't think of anything. Uh, they can't let anything else original in. Mm. This, this, you know, I tried to get this out a long time, well over a decade ago, and that's the response you get. So. My my approach was turn around uh, to heck with you. I'll just get on and do the rest of the building yeah. the universe picture. Um, <clears throat> and oh, John has very kindly set up this uh, quicycle. Uh, as an editor, he appreciates the work that's being done, and uh, that is what uh, that's what allows it, is allowing us to come out now. Otherwise, yeah. it would just one one long high. Uh, <clears throat> once went to the head of the physics department at Sydney University to discuss some aspect of uh, <clears throat> the expansion of the universe with me, and I said, "Oh, uh, along the lines like you won't you won't detect any uh, redshift from." Uh, SNE 1A beyond about 1.7. He said, oh, we've already detected them beyond two. So he, in the vector theory, goes up, looks up, and found out, no, they haven't detected them beyond two, and just walks away. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know that there is another alternative. Yeah. So thanks, John, for giving me the turn your, your, your mic. Your, Vivid, it's a real pleasure. I mean, we, we we talked. I think we met for the first time. It was in 2012, wasn't it? So it's eight years ago now. So um, yes. So this has been a long time coming. We should have done this a long time ago. Yes. But, uh, we're going to get it out now, and um, then Darwinian selection. We'll see which of the nuclear models is the one that actually goes forward, won't it? But it'd be hard to beat that one. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you. The same, the same thing about uh, Einstein's theory of gravity. It's hard to beat, but it can be extended differently to the way they're doing it now. I think it's perfect. You'll it find is. that out in a few lectures. Yeah, we can go, we can go further. You're right. And yeah. I, oh, by the way, everybody, I thoroughly recommend that one as well because that's pretty spectacular too. 
So, uh, so anyway, but nonetheless, shall we, uh, any, any more questions in a completely different vein? Otherwise, perhaps we should stop recording and maybe have just a little chat afterwards in an aftermath. And, uh, but uh, but um, any more questions on the talk per se?